Greetings, folks. It's Professor Fiore, and now it's time for another exciting topic, and that's an op amp based gyrator. What's a gyrator? What do we use them for? Basically, we're going to use them to get rid of inductors. Okay, what's so bad about inductors? They asked quietly in the background. Well, if you've watched my other videos, read my books, you know that I'm not really keen on inductors, particularly in the audio range. Why? Because when it comes to manufacturing to build real live inductors, they tend to be the least ideal of the three passive components, resistors, inductors, capacitors. We can make resistors, real world resistors, that are pretty close to the ideal resistor. And capacitors, we have quite a range of dielectrics to choose from. And we can go from very, very good capacitors to maybe not quite so good capacitors, but ones that are much less expensive and have higher volumetric efficiency. So we have a lot of latitude there. Inductors, on the other hand, when we're talking about audio frequencies, you know, when we're talking about 10 hertz, 100 hertz, a kilohertz, 10 kilohertz, things like that, 100 kilohertz, they have some issues. Basically, series resistance tends to be high. We have parasitic capacitance. Um, these very much limit the performance of the inductor. They're also affected by external magnetic fields, so we might have to shield them. Now, a large inductor, you know, lots of, lots of millihenries or even henries, is going to be a physically large device. Lots of wire. It's going to be coiled and coiled and coiled and coiled. So, you know, that's partly where the large um, internal series resistance, the coil resistance, comes from, is all of these coils of wire. All right. To make them smaller, we typically use an iron core, but that leads into the possibility of core saturation if we have too large of a signal. All right. You put all these things together and you wind up with this large, heavy, expensive, not so ideal device. Now there are areas where inductors work great, but we're going to look at some areas where they don't work so great and we have some other options. So the basic idea here is to look at a gyrator. So what the heck is going on with the gyrator? Well, this is essentially a semiconductor circuit. We can use an op amp, which is what I'm going to show you. We could use discrete transistors, but op amps generally work better. And we can create very large inductance values, you know, like Henry size inductors for a physically small footprint. Basically, it's going to take one op amp and a couple of passive components, a couple of resistors, a capacitor. And you've got yourself for this sort of uh, inductor wannabe kind of thing, right? This sort of replacement for an inductor. You don't have any problems with... Um, shielding it. So in other words, uh, external fields are not going to be a problem. You don't have to worry about core saturation. We have, uh, we haven't eliminated, but we do have fewer problems with coil resistance, with series resistance, parasitic capacitance, things like that. Which is not to say that the gyrator is perfect. Unlike a large inductor, it has limited energy storage. There are certain things you can do with inductors you can't do with gyrators. You know, um, you can exploit, for example, an inductive spike. You know, sometimes we have an RL circuit with, uh, you know, we, we open up the circuit and uh, there'll be a large kick, um, an inductive kick, they'll sometimes call it very large voltage spike. You're not going to get that with a gyrator. Uh, you're limited in terms of the maximum voltage and current swing by the op amp you're using. So, you know, you're not going to see, like you might see on an inductor, a sudden pulse that goes up to 1,000 volts. Not going to happen with a gyrator. The frequency range of the device is also limited by the op amp. So if you have a, a high-speed op amp, obviously you can have this device that works over a very, very broad range of frequency. But if you're going to limit yourself to a less expensive op amp, well, it's obviously going to have an upper limit that's maybe, you know, a few hundred kilohertz, something like that. All depends. It does require DC power. That's another issue that, uh, you know, a passive obviously doesn't need DC power. And what we're going to look at is a version that is not floating, meaning that one end of the 
sort of simulated inductor has to be tied to ground. Now, there's ways around that, but this is just a simple single op amp circuit. So before we actually get into the construction of the gyrator, I want to lead into this with some simple um, RLRC circuits. So both of these, right, this guy down here, the C1R1, and the, the upper one, the R2L1, these create lead networks. Right? You've probably seen these before looking at uh, AC circuit analysis. Essentially, for the first one, at low frequencies, C1 opens up. Think of this as a voltage divider. So at low frequencies, all of the signal, all the generator signal, falls across the capacitor. We don't get anything at the output. At really high frequencies, it's the exact opposite. Right? C shorts out. We get everything at the load, at, at R1. So this is a high-pass filter. That's another way to look at it, a lead network. So a similar thing happens with the inductor. Right? At really low frequencies, L1 is ideally a short, so we don't get anything for this voltage. All of the input drops across to R2. And at really high frequencies, L opens up, very big X of L. So we wind up getting all of the signal, right? And you can just remember that with your basic uh, reactance formulas, right? X of L is 2 pi FL. Um, X sub C, 1 over 2 pi FC. So we just solve these in terms of the frequencies right, X of, X of L over 2 pi L and 1 over 2 pi X of CC. And then the critical frequency, in other words, where that filter starts to curve, where we start to go from passing everything to attenuating signal, the critical frequency, in other words, is where X of L and R, or X sub C and R, are equal, same value. So we just substitute in here uh, R for the reactance values, right? And we have our appropriate equation. So the critical frequency for the inductor version is R divided by 2 pi L. And for the capacitor version, it's 1 over 2 pi RC, right? So this, this shouldn't be new to you, go having gone through AC circuits, right? But I do want to point this out because, you know, with, with these values, we're not stuck with a certain specific value of resistance or inductance or capacitance to get a certain critical frequency, right? We can scale them. In other words, um, you know, we can bring the value of R up. As long as I bring the value of L up by the same factor, critical frequency stays the same. Similar sort of thing with the capacitor, right? If I bring R up, I can bring C down, and those two things will cancel each other out, and we'll get the same critical frequency. Or if we want to translate the critical frequency, right, we can do that by changing either one, either R or L or R or C, back here. So let's just do a real quick uh, Bode plot on this just to see what's going on. All right. All right. So we can see the high pass nature of this. Now, it might not be immediately apparent, but there are two curves here. All right. See, there are two curves. They're just right on top of each other. So if you were wondering why I had these kind of goofy values, instead of just using 1K for each of these, I've got 1.01 and 1.02, is so that you could actually see that there are two curves. Otherwise, they would perfectly overlay on top of each other, and you wouldn't see much of anything. So I'm zooming in just to show you that there are, in fact, two curves, and they're right on top of each other. All right. If I had chosen exactly 1K for each of them, you, know, you would have just seen one line. Right. But we are getting the sort of uh, response we expect, right? Up here, we're looking at, uh, you know, zero, uh, zero dB, uh, no loss. This is actually coming in at, uh, you know, negative two milli dB. So that's zero. We'll find our three decibel down point, which would be the critical frequency. And I'll just come in here, right around here. So that's right around uh, 16 kilohertz which if you went through the calculation, the you know, 1 over 2 pi um, RC kind of thing, you would find that it does in fact work out to um, 15.9, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera, kilohertz if you had the exact values. All right, so 16 kilohertz, we'll just call it 16 kilohertz, looks good, right? Like I said, we can play with these values. So I'm just going to throw in another one over here where we have some other ones, right? So we could crank the resistance up. So here's a version like this with the capacitor, the RC circuit. So you could crank the resistor up. Or, you know, I made another version over here with the inductor where I went the other way, right? Drop the resistor down. And again, you know, I fudged all these resistors just a little bit 
so that we could see them. So all four of these should behave the same way, right? So for the inductive case up here, you know, I said, all right, it's R and, o, R and L, one over the other. So whatever factor I change one by, I change the other by. So here I just said, okay, R, we're gonna drop that by a factor of 10. L, we're gonna drop that by a factor of 10. That should cancel out the same critical frequency. It's a reciprocal thing happening over here with the capacitor. So um, the R and the C go in the opposite direction because I want this product to be the same. So what I do is, in this case, I drop the cap by a factor of 10. So I had to increase R by a factor of 10, right? That gets me the same product. And when we do that uh, Bode plot, we should get four coincident curves. Bonk, and there's what we saw last time, right? There's the critical frequency right about 16. 16 kilohertz right in here. And again, I'll just zoom in for you doubters out there. There are four curves, okay? In fact, if I had a fifth one that was exactly 1K, it would be right here in this little gap, right? That would be the exact 1K that we would have, okay? Beautiful. So what about the gyrator? I've been flapping my gums here about these RL and RC circuits. Okay, so we're going to go back to this, and I'm going to add, for comparison, um, a gyrator version, All right? So here's a gyrator version. So here's the circuit that we left, right, with the, uh, the two lead networks. And this is my sort of simulated um, inductor, right, the gyrator. What the heck is going on here? Well, this is actually a lot simpler than it looks at first. This whole thing can be approximated as this, an inductor with a series coil resistance. All right, now how does it work? And by the way, you will notice that I've, I've just chosen this. It doesn't have to be this way, but I just did it just to kind of prove a point. I've used the same value for this cap and this resistor, which I'm calling the gyrator cap and resistor, CG and RG, as I did over here in the original lead network. So what I know is that this little two element RC network should have the exact same response as the one we started with, right? So this should have that same roughly 16 kilohertz critical frequency lead network response, right? High pass kind of response. So the other path that we have into the op amp is through this resistor, right? This RX resistor, the mystery resistor. And there is a direct feedback, a simple wire going from the output back to pin two. Now, one thing we know about the op amp is the differential input voltage, if everything's operating correctly, should be zero or darn close to it, right? The op amp tries to hold that differential input, the error voltage, as we sometimes call it, tries to hold that at zero. So the voltage from here to here, if you put a meter across here, right, should be pretty darn close to zero. All right. So here's what's, here's what's happening, right? As the uh, frequency goes from a high value Right, at a high value, CG is very small, and the generator voltage is basically going to appear here, so that's what I would have over here, all right? As we go to a lower and lower and lower frequency, the X sub C over here gets bigger and bigger and bigger and bigger, and it takes up more and more and more of that input signal, right? So in other words, the voltage at this node, at the node, th the pin three of the op amp over here, the plus input, this is starting to drop as we go down in frequency. And the op amp feedback is going to force this pin to do the same thing. In other words, this path out through here behaves just the same as this path up here, right? As the RL version of this. So in between these two things, right? So this RX is basically the R2. And this op amp and, R and the CGRG basically is the L. So... What's between them, right, the point between them, what I'm calling VG, this node right here, so here's the R value, is essentially this point right here. RX is like our coil, and then this other business is the inductor L, all right? So you're kind of fooling this end of it to behave the same as the RC version of it, just because the op amp needs to keep these two points the same. Right, the feedback is enforcing that. Okay, so that way we know that this path 
has to kind of look like this. Now, it turns out if you if you go through the analysis on this, the Rx value is equivalent to the coil. And the effective value of the inductor can be found by multiplying the uh, CG value, the capacitor you have, times the RG value, its associated value, times this other resistance value, right? This coil resistance value. Just ignore the units, right? I realize that farads times ohms times ohms doesn't get you Henry's, but this is just the way it works. So you kind of think of this as a value in farads, a value in ohms, a value in ohms. You're going to get a value in Henry's. So you just take 10 nano times 1 kilo times 100, and you're gonna, you'll get an appropriate answer. You'll, you'll get one milli, and you'll know that's in Henry's, right? So this whole thing looks like a one millihenry uh, inductor, one millihenry, millihenry coil. So if I do a, a Bode plot on this, I should get three pretty much identical results. Again, slightly off because, you know, I skewed the resistor so we can actually see three individual plots, right? So there we go. Now let me zoom into this again so that we can see it. And in fact, there are the three. Okay, put the thing out here. So VG, which is our simulated inductor right in the middle, that's the maroon one. That's the guy that's right in the middle of this, right? Because that's the one I didn't, I didn't sort of monkey with that has the exact values, okay? So the L is um, exactly one millihenry and the R is 100 ohms rather than being like 101, right? and so forth. Okay, so if this whole thing is basically an R coil and an L, how do I make a useful circuit out of this? I mean, this by itself just shows you it's possible to make a lead network, but you can do a lot more with it, right? Anytime that you would use like an RLC network, series parallel, something like that, as long as you can configure it so that the inductor is tied to ground, because this thing has to be tied to ground the way it's drawn out, you can use this to replace the inductor. So here's an example, All right? So I've got two versions. I've got the entire passive version, and then I've got the gyrator version. So these two resistors are the same. This is basically just an RLC series network where you're tapping across the C and the L, all right? Now, if you remember in the series, that's going to create a dip, right? That's going to create a dip in the, in the response of the system. You basically have a notch filter. And uh, if you've forgotten, the critical frequency for this you find is one over two pi times the square root of the quantity LC. In other words, multiply the 100 nanofarads by the 10 millihenries, take the square root times two pi, take the reciprocal. You've got the critical frequency, which works out to be approximately five kilohertz, all right? The value of R2 over here will actually set the damping. In other words, um, how tight that notch is. Okay, the total resistance actually does that, but that's sort of the biggie right here. All right, the gyrator version uses the same 1K, right, as the R2, the R1, and the C1 and the C2, same deal, 100 nanofarad, 100 nanofarad. So what I'm saying is this whole thing here is the equivalent of an R coil and L, is this. And this thing should be set up to get 100 ohms for R coil and an L of 10 millihenry. So... I'm going to put in 100 ohms for the Rx, and then I just have to manipulate the values that I have. Now, I just, for convenience, I left this at 10 nanofarads, which required me to crank up um, Rg by a factor of 10 because I needed 10 millihenries. The preceding one was only 1 millihenry, so there's a slight change here. But that's, this is basically how you go about doing it. Um, so that's 10 millihenries. Right? I already said that the uh, Rx is our coil, which is 100 ohms. That's great. So that's kind of where you start. Set up your R coil, and then you can just figure out uh, the, the CG, RG values to get the multiplier that you need to get the appropriate uh, inductance, okay? Now, there are some practical limits here, right? I mean, you can, you can kind of monkey these things up and down all day, but you, you be careful about getting too small for RX because that will require possibly large currents uh, you know, coming in from your source. So... Because remember, at, at, at very low frequencies, almost all of the signal is going to drop out here. So um, you might, this differential at some frequencies could get kind of large. So you, you have to just be, be aware of that, all right? So 
how much lower would I go? Well, probably not. I think I would kind of stick with the hundred. Um, you know, it all depends on what your source is ultimately and, you know, the, the op amp you have and so forth. But having said that, you know, this, this does present a, a bound, if you will. All right. And just, just how low you can, you can go with this thing. Okay. Um, you can play with these, of course, right? You don't want to get too, too big with RG. Um, you probably, in a case like that, if you had big resistors out here, you, you probably want to go to a bifet, which is what I have. A TL071 is a bifet, so it's got a FET diff amp on the front end, so the input bias currents are very small. But nonetheless, right, those are, those are some little details that you can, you can kind of flesh out um, in accordance with the demands of, of your particular design. But in any case, this right, should be equal to this. And by our calculations, this whole thing should be the same as this, right? Within those practical bounds that I mentioned. Okay, so let's go and do an analysis and see how well this works. Okay, now we can see, right? Green is the gyrator output and the maroon is the uh, capacitor inductor output. So we see the appropriate notch, and this comes in at right about 5 kilohertz, right? This is a semi-log graph, so that's 1K, 2K, 3K, 4K, there's 5K right there. So the peaks are coming in. The obvious thing going on that looks a little like asymmetrical, that looks weird, is that the gyrator is dying out here, right? The response is dying at very high frequencies, right? That's 100 kilohertz. So above 100 kilohertz, it's really peeling away. And the reason for this is the limited bandwidth of the op amp. Right? That doesn't go out forever. If you had a, a, a wider bandwidth op amp, in other words, something with a greater F unity, you could expect better performance out of this. But, you know, the, the 071 is, is uh, like uh, somewhere around a 3 megahertz F unity, so you can't expect this thing to be, you know, following this thing perfectly flat out to several megahertz. It's just not going to happen. But if you were using this for some kind of audio filter, you only have to go up to 20 kilohertz, right, for audio. Um, and the match is really good. I mean, the match is actually quite good up to, you know, about 100 kilohertz. Each one of these ticks is only a dB, right? So you're only like, you know, a dB and a little change off even at 100 kilohertz. So this is actually working pretty well, all right? Okay, so, you know, downside, like I said, you do have power supplies you have to throw in there. I mean, schematically, wow, this does look a lot simpler. But, you know, Go out and price a good quality 10 millihenry inductor that, uh, you know, has an appropriate coil resistance, okay? You know, they're, they're not cheap if, to, get a, to get a nice quality uh, coil. So, and certainly we can, you know, if we wanted to, we could come up with examples of this that are much, much more extreme than this. This is sort of a very much a, a middle of the road kind of thing. But the basic idea is if you have a circuit, some kind of RLC circuit, series parallel, what have you, and you've got this inductor that is ground referenced, hey, you can go to a gyrator. It's a nice little sort of variation. It's, it has its advantages. Um, you know, all depends on the details. Now, I'm going to throw one last thing in here because students are always asking, hey, can I use this to replace the coils in my uh, loudspeaker crossover network? Because I need, you know, if you're a DIY person, you know you're going to need big coils, right, typically. You might need hundreds of millihenries, and they have to, you know, they're going to be big. Let's just be honest with it. You know, they look like spools of copper wire when you, when you look at these things, and they're expensive. So people always ask me, hey, can I use a gyrator for that? Sad to say, no, you can't. The reason being is it's not so much the 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 fact that it needs DC power, which would be an inconvenience, but the passives are designed to handle a lot of current from your power amplifier, right? Big signal swings. You try to throw one of these in there, you're going to fry this op amp in very short order. It's just never going to be able to deal with that. So on paper, yes, you could make, you know, a 500 millihenry or a 5 henry for that matter coil with the gyrator. Um, and then the simulator will look fine, but when you actually start pumping power into it, you know, you got your 200 watt power amp going into it, forget it. This is going to turn into a puff of smoke. It's not going to work, right? Just won't. And besides, even if you got like a 
big juicy power uh, op amp in here, you would still have an issue with, with the RX value, which sets your R coil. Okay, this is one case where the, the R coil, the lower limit on this thing, would be insufficient, right? And you'd have to go to a big, massive, you know, preferably air core um, copper coil for that, for your loudspeaker. Um, some people would use a, an iron core, but that does have saturation potential. The, the air core, you don't have to worry about it saturating, but, you know, there's going to be a lot of copper in there. So sorry to be the bearer of, of bad news, but, you know, there are limitations. Okay. But certainly low level signals, you know, normal signal processing kind of things. Gyrator's great. It'll, it'll work perfectly well. All right. Okay, any comments, leave them down in the comment area. Any questions, same thing. Have a good one, and we'll see you next time.